Amen. Well, how are you all doing? Yeah, we all got through Christmas. Isn't that a relief? How old do you think you were when Christmas stopped being fun and started being more stress? About 10 years ago, okay. You know, we have to bake all the pies, because those you can't pre-bake, because then they'll get weird by the time it's Christmas Day. You know, you got to make sure all the presents are, first of all, there. And with the supply chain and all of that, that's been a stress. And then you have to wrap them, and wrapping presents has always been my weak point. But now, now, church, we're, we're in the home stretch. The leftovers are in the fridge. The presents are open. The in-laws are returning home. Everywhere you look, it's, it's sort of like the hustle and bustle has calmed down. And that's true of our gospel reading as well. We, uh, we follow the lectionary at this church, a set of readings that, have, um, that go three years in length and really cover the entire Bible. And how the lectionary works is it starts over every Christmas season, and then we re-enter the story now. And so we're in the beginning of the story, the end of the year, but the beginning of the story. The point uh, before Jesus will encounter the Pharisees or Pilate, It's before Jesus will even call his own disciples. It's really early on. And it's a lot of the the small, kind of subdued stories of the Bible. These next several weeks, they're going to be uh, a lot like my dinner with Andre. All talk, no action. And so looking to the story, you can imagine, this was a big year for Jesus, where we're catching him in the scriptures. In Jewish culture, 12, it was, of course, the beginning of that all-important transition to adulthood. And it was in this year that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus would have once again traveled by a caravan to the Passover feast in Jerusalem. And they would travel like this in a caravan with all their neighbors and all their friends, first so that they could uh, ward off any bandits or robbers along the way by, by how many they had in their crowd, And second of all, just to give the kids someone to spend some time with. And it was about a three-day trek, and so they're making their way out, and they get to the Passover feast, and they start to make their way back. And, of course, this was a big year for Mary and Joseph. Jesus, he was 12. He was starting to be, as they understood, an adult. And so he was mature enough to walk with his friends, not be under the constant watchful eye of his parents. So I like to imagine Mary and Joseph, they're walking back with the rest of the group, and they're telling them all about how mature their son is getting, maybe bragging a bit about his accomplishments, you know, really feeling good, because all the other kids have stopped them at least five times to ask, when will we get there? Can we stop to use the bathroom? But they haven't heard a peep from Jesus. And so they're bragging on him a little bit. You can imagine that. And it's that evening, the first day into their three-day trek, where they stop and they get ready to rest at night, and they realize, oh, Jesus isn't here. And so, of course, they were worried, but traveling by night on those roads was no-go. That was a non-starter. So Mary and Joseph, they had to wait and get up the next morning after having not slept at all that night. They were worried about their son. They had to let all their neighbors and friends know that they were just bragging to how they have to go travel back, get Jesus, because it turns out maybe he wasn't as mature as they thought. And now they have to travel back, retracing their steps for an entire day, but now without the numbers around them. And so, you know, now they have to be on a constant vigilance for robbers and bandits. And then finally they get to Jerusalem, and that's the big city. And so they have to just search the entire big city because if he's still there, where is he? Finally, after we're told three days of them searching, they, they finally check the temple and there he is. And of course, there's a strong mix of emotions when they find him. On the one hand, Mary tells Jesus that the whole ordeal that he's put them through, it's been one of great anxiety. That's actually a little bit watered down when the scripture says great anxiety. The Greek word that's used is torturous. Jesus, what you put your your mother and I through is torturous. 
I think we've all had that conversation growing up. But there's also a sense of astonishment that's going on. You know, first that Jesus would be in the, in the temple of all places in the big city. Imagine if you and your family went down to Dallas and you misplaced your, your 12-year-old. And then after searching for three days, you didn't find them in any of the places you could get to in Dallas. You found them in a church. That'd be astonishing. And it's astonishing just as well because Jesus at the temple, he wasn't there shaking and, and frightened and nervous. Instead, he was in deep conversation, keeping up with the head rabbi, having this amazing intuition for the scriptures and how best to interpret them. So Mary and Joseph, they run up, they grab a hold of him. You know, they finally let out a big breath and they start to regain their composure. And it's at this point that Jesus, he reminds his parents of who he is. He says to them, why would you look elsewhere? I must be in my father's house. It's as if to say, of course Jesus is in the temple. Of course Jesus is growing in his knowledge and wisdom towards God. Of course Jesus' attention is penetrating the, the hidden, unseen reality of things. It's Jesus, what do you expect? Of course, even at 12, he is seeking a wise way of life that transforms and forgives and finds favor amongst men and even God. What else is he to do? This is the baseline. This is Jesus' disposition, his focus. And that's really all the scripture has for us today. Like I said, it's a subdued sort of time we're entering into in the lectionary. But it's a story that sticks out for us. This is, after all, the only story we get in our Bibles of Jesus between the time he'd be born and the time when he'd be about 30 going off to call his disciples. But you see, it's a passage I don't yet understand that is incredibly hard to preach because there's, there's not much there. No one's quite sure what to do with it. You know, some have preached on it and made the focus of the sermon about how difficult it is to raise a teenager, or I guess a, a tween, teenager. And I'm sure that's true, but you know, that's not the point of this scripture. Others, they have, uh, they have pointed out when Jesus says, I must be in my father's house, and they've shoehorned in this, this big elaborate talk of, well, who is Jesus' real father? And again, true, but not what the scripture is getting at. There are even some brave souls, I want you to understand, some brave souls who have taken this scripture and preached on it and said, maybe spending time in the temple should be a priority over even your family. Right? We don't like to hear that in American churches. So we like, you know, the concept of God must love the nuclear family. But we won't be going down that rabbit hole, but it's in there. But again, this is, this is the one insight we have into Jesus' adolescence. What's it telling us? What's it telling us by saying that he was about the things of God? Well, it's saying that Jesus, even at 12, focused on God. He did that by choice. In fact, he flourished when he did it. You know, there's nothing like finding your passion, the thing you'd naturally do if you could do anything. But even further than that, it, it clues us into this truth that whatever we focus on is what will grow in us. Whatever you focus on later will be the things that you say, of course, to. The big theological understanding is uh, found within the doctrine of the hypostatic union, that Jesus is fully God and fully human, and how those two work together is that he is united in his personhood, not by force of will. That Jesus, he didn't spend every day forcing himself to be the son of God. Jesus is the son of God. And so deep within him, deep within him, even down to what he spent his attention on, it was the will of God. It teaches us before Jesus did anything, he was present with God. And what you focus on will determine where you end up. We can see that in a, in a small way, even when we go to see a movie. 
You know, have you ever noticed that? You go to see a movie and you find the character you identify with and all of a sudden, whenever they're excited, you get excited, they're in the seat. Whenever they're nervous, you start getting nervous. If it's a good movie, it'll do that. Sometimes people have to sort of snap you out of it and it's like, oh, the mob boss isn't after me, that's just in the movie. That shows you that when you get focused on something, it, it impacts you in a deep way. I saw the same thing whenever I was a youth minister years ago. You know, you'd spend all your time trying to get kids to just settle down and listen for just a minute, and it wouldn't work. Week after week, you could teach them the same lesson. It wouldn't matter. But then what would happen is you'd take them to church camp once, and by the time their phones died, it was open season. All of a sudden, that lesson you were trying to teach them actually sticks. All of a sudden, things just start to work. You finally have that of course moment because they're finally focused. Right? And we see that same thing here too. Jesus, he could have done anything he liked in the big city, but he focused on the things of God and it grew in him. I like to think Luke, he included this in his account right after Jesus' birth because he anticipated the lectionary. I know he didn't, but I like to think it that Luke anticipated the lectionary. He anticipated that sometime, somewhere, there would be a church that needs kind of a, an easy sermon after the big day of Christmas. And so that's all he's saying. He's saying Jesus focused on the things of God, and of course it grew in him. And it's an opportunity. We get to reflect. We get to reorient. We get to decide what we're going to focus on in this next year. See, this question, this question that we almost never get to ask ourselves because we're so distracted by projects and tasks of life and making sure everything's set for Christmas. The question is, if you were free for three days straight, no tasks, no responsibilities, what would you focus on? When life slows down a little bit and you don't have a deadline, where would your mind go? I know in the hustle and bustle of the year and then the additional hustle and bustle of the holidays, we sort of cover that up. We like to think that that's an irrelevant question because most of us stay busy most of the time. But the truth is, and what we see here is that our focus is more determinable of ourselves than our actions are. Our focus is upstream of our actions. Another way of putting that is, we are constituted by our being, not our doing. Who we are and who we will be happens so much more when we're waiting at How's that? Oh, much better. All right, like I said, lighthearted, easygoing time this, this season. Oh, I wish I could blame someone, but you know, that's just me not, obviously my focus was not the batteries. All right, what I'm getting into is that if you can figure out what you're focused on, you can figure out what your future will be. Jesus, he focused on the things of God, and naturally, he ended up doing the things of God. I think we've had an opportunity in this past year, this time of, can we turn the mic down a little bit though? I have to back off a bit. It's fine? It's fine, okay. Oh, thank you all for being patient with me. It's good that it happened today. That is a blessing from God that it happened today and not during the Christmas Eve service, amen? We've had a chance to pause and reflect during this time of COVID. We've had a chance to determine what we're gonna be focused on. And I'm really excited about this church. I, I'm very excited about what we've seen this time of COVID because we've had the opportunity to not be like Mary and Joseph, not running around for 
three days straight trying to track down Jesus, but instead just sitting, sort of by force during COVID, sitting, reflecting, reorienting. And so I want to share a few of the things that I see as focuses of this church, because I think it anticipates where we're going to be as we get back into it, as COVID settles down a little bit in the future. First, I've seen the optimism and the joy that's been shared this year. And that really excites me. You know, for a year that's been in the middle of a global pandemic, a year that started with an insurrection and questions of, will America even stand? We had no reason to be joyful this year. What were we doing? Yet what did we do? We refocused, we said, okay, there's that, but you know what? We're gonna get on top of things anyway. We're gonna find joy, we're gonna find togetherness, we're gonna find comfort anyway. And that is awesome. That is gonna influence our actions for a long time, lead to so many great, of course, moments. We've seen such a passion for missions, even throughout this year. You know, oddly enough, I've, I've kind of loved seeing how frustrated we are that we can't do a lot of hands-on missions this year. I, of course, it's been awful. Of course, we, we wish we could be closer, more than six feet apart from people. But it's shown us just the, the passion that it's an of course thing for this church that we're about missions. So that's good. That shows us our focus. We've seen some of course moments in the relationships that have flourished. There's been so much negativity in, in and around the whole world. There's been this epidemic of isolation that's been happening. And here at the church, we've bucked that trend completely. We've been a place where if you make even the slightest amount of effort, you walk away with some real friends. That's something that we can say, of course, to. We see that with the volunteering and the support of various projects throughout this year. You know, it's been awesome to talk with folks and have them ask things like, do you all have Wi-Fi or do you all have services online? And the answer is, of course. We focused on being a church that could respond to this pandemic and really be ready for the 21st century, and look at that, now we are. It's even been with colleagues in ministry. I get to, I get to look good because of how many volunteers we have. I get questions, are you all ready to, to host the regional assembly for the entire three-state region to come here? It's, of course. Do you all have plans in place for when you reopen some? And of course. Are you all somehow more organized now than you were before you got into the pandemic? Of course. We took a lot of things this year as, as a reason to get in position for what comes next, to hone our focus, to not give up, but to say what we are focusing on today will determine where we're going to be at tomorrow. And we've done so well with that. You know, on so many levels, this scripture and its simple call to note what our focus is has met us in the challenge of quarantines and social distancing and all the messes that we've seen in the past year or so. And in a lot of ways, it, it hasn't just been an external challenge, it's been an internal challenge. It's been a challenge of mindfulness. And we didn't let that tear us up or cause us to get distracted. Instead, we use that as a call to get focused, to get ready for what God's going to be doing next. At the end of the day, that's what this scripture is getting at, that if you find where you're focused, you're going to find where you're going to be. And I think that gives us a whole lot of reason to celebrate.
we now come to the time that we celebrate every time we come together on the Lord's Day, where we go to the Last Supper he had with his disciples, and he spoke of how to put himself in us by taking the bread, his body, and the wine, his blood, that Jesus may be in us and through us. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can participate. Participate in the Last Supper. Thank you, Lord, that in thinking about the Last Supper, we can realize that you are in us. Lord, help us to practice the discipline that you may be through us and that people may be uplifted by you in our lives to the glory of God. Amen. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take of it, all of you, eat of it, and do so in remembrance of me. In a similar way, we know he took the cup after supper. Lifting it up, he gave thanks for it. He said, this cup is a new covenant, sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin of many people. Take of it, all of you, drink of it, and do so in remembrance of me. We are told that whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the living Lord's death until he comes again. Would you please stand for the invitation to discipleship? Church, as many of us go out to choose New Year's resolutions, and to mentally prep ourselves for the time to come. Let us ask ourselves, what do we want to say, of course, to? Let that teach us what our focus ought to be. Receive now this benediction. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.